Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business, and I think we've done it. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset that was originally used in the Gutenberg Press. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. Everything else was printed in regular type. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify Black Letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Welcome to season two of Black Letter and the unfiltered, uncut version of season two. So welcome to season two. And today we're talking to Kevin Repper on my right and David Ludwig on my left. Kevin runs the patent prosecution practice at Dunlap Bennett and Ludwig. Patent prosecution practice, the three Ps, P cubed. So patent prosecution is all about protecting ideas. And there are a number of ways you can do that. Trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, and patents. And patents are a little bit different. Patents are the only way you can actually protect an actual idea. People always uh, say, well, I want to copyright my idea or I want to trademark that idea. And you can't do that. What can you do? You can patent it. And that's why we're here to talk to Kevin. Kevin, welcome to Black Letter, season Thank two, you. episode or whatever. Um, so before we get into the patent stuff, I want to introduce you. So I know, Kevin, that you have been a patent uh, prosecution, uh, patent attorney, prosecuting patents for a really long time. Yeah. And on top of that, I know your father's a patent prosecution attorney, your brother's a patent prosecution attorney, and you grew up when you were like eight years old, you were helping your dad prosecute patents. It's kind of like almost, yeah. Yeah. Cradle to grave, not the grave part, but at least cradle till now, you're you're helping people protect their ideas and you're helping your dad at uh whatever firm he's at uh do that when you were a kid, even. So um so tell me a little bit about kind of how you ended up. So what what is your to be a patent prosecutor, you've got to have some kind of technical background. Is yes, that right? That's correct. Okay. Either science or engineering. Okay, so what's your technical background? Um, my technical background is in uh, chemistry and biology. I um, do a lot of mechanical inventions, though. You know, as long as you have that technical background, mm -hmm. you can pretty much prosecute any invention uh, as long as you do the research and make it work. So at the firm, you've got the U.S. patent prosecutors, the Chinese team. So I uh, understand you have electrical engineers and mechanical and bio um, is software, yeah. uh, all of that stuff. So, so does that go to different attorneys depending on what kind of patent it is? Yeah, I mean, it goes to the attorney, you know, who has not only expertise, but who's comfortable with the technology. Gotcha. Right. So, you know, if we get a software case and we have an attorney that, you know, specifically does software inventions, that's who's getting the case. Um, but, you know, if it's simpler and people want to, you know, try and reach out and try and to do, you know, new technologies, uh, we're there to assist the other attorneys okay. as well. What is and what isn't a patent? What does a patent do? What does it protect and what does it give you? Okay, so a patent uh, gives you the ability to prevent others from making, using or selling the invention. Um, so, you know, and it gives you 20 years of protection. If you have an invention you want to go with a patent because a trademark copyright. So that's, for, that's for like protection. a legal monopoly, right? Essentially, it is you a can legal stop monopoly. other people from doing your idea. But let me ask you this. So I have an idea that, um, you know, my website's really cool. And I have an idea on how to sell legal services to people by using a website with purple buttons. You know, that's my, that's my idea. Purple buttons. Can I patent that? So there is a, a threshold of patentability. Um, different types of colors, that sort of thing. That's not going to be patentable. Uh, if you have some sort of unique function with a website, that's when you get into to patentable territory. So you can patent a function of a website software? Because I've heard that this Alice case, like, oh, you can't patent software. Is that true? So it, it depends, ultimately. Um, Lawyer, lawyer's answer, right? Yes, it depends. Yeah, and uh, you know, in 2014, they had the Alice case, which made things very difficult uh, when it comes to software patents. But since then, there's been a lot of federal circuit cases that have improved your chances of getting a software patent. 
Yeah. For example, if, if there's a technical solution to a technical problem, typically they will allow that for patentability. Okay, so the federal circuits walked back the Alice case a little bit. So now yes. you've got a good chance of getting a patent on software if it technical solution to technical problem. I also understand there's like, if you have a technical solution that affects something in the real world, like hardware or something else. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, if it improves upon the computer itself, it's a uh, patentable subject matter. Oh, so if you change the architecture of the computer with something you do in software, that can, if it speeds up the RAM or compresses video or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, for example, if, if you're moving data around in a unique way that makes the computer actually function faster, mm -hmm. it's potentially patentable. And that's just software. We're not talking about hardware. Gotcha. So why do you need a patent? Well, um, if you want to protect your invention, if you want to pretend, uh, prevent others from making, using, and selling the invention within the United States, then that's what you need. You, know, you need a patent to protect that. Um, and, you know, just you know, something to keep in mind, it's each country you have to file in um, on its own. So if you want to, uh, to protect your invention in Canada or other countries, you have to file in that particular So country. if I file a patent in the U.S., I don't own the patent in the whole world. That's right. But, I own the patent in the U.S. But you can prevent people from making, using, or selling the invention within the United States. But they so, can still make it in China and ship it to England, right? That's correct. But if they make it in China, try and sell in the U.S., you can prevent them from doing so. Okay. So and that goes to our patent litigation team. Yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how that international piece works. So if I file a U.S. patent, does that give me any right to use that information? Or do I have to find another patent attorney in Canada? or a patent attorney in China or in England? Do I have to find a new patent attorney to file there? So the way it works is you want to keep the inventions consistent within each country. So you're going to come to us if you want to file a, a patent in Canada. We start within the US, then we file within Canada, we file within Mexico, we file within the EU, uh, but we work with the uh, firms within that particular country so that we keep everything consistent uh, and you have protection that's consistent throughout those countries. So you want to go with one firm in the U.S. to manage that. Um, so I get a little off topic. So what was your the, what was your favorite? I don't know if you do you have a favorite patent that you've ever prepared or prosecuted. Um, well, you or know, an interesting one. Just give me one that you thought sure. thought was well. This was a cool thing or a neat. Yeah. So we had a a couple design patents that have been pretty interesting. Uh, one of them was an underwater hotel, which got some uh, publicity. It was published in an article um, in which it was a design patent to protect how the uh, hotel looked, and it was an underwater hotel. It was very interesting. And Popular uh, Mechanics, is that yeah, right? Yeah. Is that where the article is? I, I believe so, yeah. And, you know, I don't know if he's actually going to build the uh, underwater hotel. We're hoping so, uh, but we'll, we'll soon find out, hopefully. Um, I also enjoy, you know, when I receive some, some of the uh, inventors will actually send me uh, their inventions. I have a, uh, like, for example, a 3D beer pong stand. Really? It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. I, uh, I've used it at a couple of parties. So how does it work? So it's, it's basically got different uh, levels. So you got the one cup and then the three cups above that. And then the last level with the four cups, I believe. Pyramid kind of. Exactly. Pyramid. And it just adds a new element. You so have to... the cups are part of the pat, like the stand itself? No, so you still so you use put solo cups. cups in there. Yeah, that's right. And then is it for uh, traditional slow pong, speed pong, or is it like the throwing? Beer pong, you're throwing it in, and it's oh, just, just the that. throwing. You're yeah. not using the paddles. No, no. You know that's a... weird because in college we had uh, like beer pong with paddles. You'd play ping pong. You try to hit the cup. You guys didn't play that. We I never played that. Yeah. What? You guys are so like <laughs> new school. We literally we'd play ping pong with the paddles, and you would try to sink it in the cup while you played. And then we had a version called speed pong. Like at my college, that was Sigma Chi, and they would try to knock the cups over, which seems silly. And you'd we, have to chug have the drink in. Well, it. but you try to sink it. And if you sunk the ball in the cup while you were playing ping pong, you could do a throwback. And if you sunk it in their cup, they would have to chug. But if they sunk it in yours, they would get the point, and you would have to chug. Yeah, um, I've I've ran into a lot of different variations. I have, the throwback one I don't get. You just throw the balls back and forth across the table. Well, you're just trying to get it, you know, in the cups. Yeah, but not with the paddle. No, I've never, I've never played it with the paddle. So, all right, we're, we're going to have to educate you guys. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on yeah, that. Yeah, it sounds like fun, actually, a new element to it. Well, that's, that's the old element. You yeah. guys are, I <laughs> yeah, don't know, I feel like me. this is like, oh, we're in, as millennials, no offense. But, we, you know, we can't actually play ping pong. We've just got to throw, the, no, I'm just kidding. So, um, 
Tell me about the weirdest patent that you've done. I've had a, a couple. You can of, go uh, gross. I'm fine with ones. gross. When I first started working here, actually, um, seven years ago or so, uh, he was a unique client to say the least. Uh, and he came up with a, a cure for cancer in which you mix paprika with lemon zest and you snort it. And that was, uh, and apparently cancer has been cured. So, yeah, so, you know, this, if you're not doing this now at home, um, I'm not a doctor, so I can advocate it all at once. Yeah. Unfortunately, he didn't have the data to back it up. So I convinced him not to move forward with a patent application. Well, that's not, I remember, I think you told me about this. He said he had the data and it was at the hospital. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. and you said, wait, you have the data, send it to us. Snorting paprika and lemon zest, you cured cancer. He said, well, I have it. They haven't given it to me yet, but I know they finished their tests at the hospital because I'm psychic. That's absolutely right. And I forgot about that. Yeah. It just goes to, to show how unique of a client he was. <laughs> was that he was psychic and that's how he knew that his test sure. was successful. We we're kind of like, well, that's, that, right. that's a winner. So we, we wrote a recommendation letter to Johns Hopkins and now I guess he's uh, overseeing their <laughs> oncology department. Yes. That's yeah. So fair, something like that. He's progressed. Maybe not. Um, so my, my favorite uh, that I've heard about, and I don't know if you were involved, I heard about it from one of the staff, was the Nasty Pants patent. Yeah, that was actually a fun one because... And you got um, it granted? It went through a long process. So I think the examiner that and, was... And just for our, our viewing audience, it's not actually titled Nasty Pants. I think that's what the staff called it. Yeah, well, appropriately so. I mean, we had a, a <laughs> form-fitting pants with uh, hair, pubic hair. In the, Sewn into in the, it. And they were in, in nude color, right? Yes. Yeah, they were so like stockings with the pubic hair that sewn onto it. Naked when you wore them. So it was a fun thing, you know, to go to parties in, maybe <laughs> Halloween. I don't know. I mean, tell us how did it work out for you last Halloween? <laughs> yeah, we actually got plenty of samples of those. We all wore them. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that was a fun case because. Um, Where did we you actually, get the real pubic hair? I, you know, I Never think. Asked. I don't. I'm hoping it's not real pubic hair. <laughs> I, I think it's fake hair, but. I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not going to take the, the smell test for that one. But anyways. <laughs> like um, wash it. Yeah, you could wash it. That's true. That's, that's fair. But um, yeah, it, we had to appeal it. So we had a, a pretty conservative examiner, I would say. And she said that it was inappropriate. Um, and one of her uh, good attorneys, uh, Daniel Finnegan, he actually did some research on other patents that were actually much worse than nasty pants as examples of ones that have been granted. Uh, and he submitted that to the examiner. They event eventually appealed it and he won. So it was actually a, a pretty successful case. And that is now, is that a product we can buy today? Um, that's a good question. We haven't followed up because we aren't super interested in purchasing those <laughs> pants, but, um, but you got them a patent. I can double check on that. Yeah. You got them a patent. Yeah, so yeah, look yeah, into it's... that. Let's see if we can get a sample yes. uh, to share with the viewing audience. Um, It'll have that design uh, what, number are you on willing it? to model it as the as I'd be one happy of, to next next podcast or maybe just get Finnegan to send us a, a selfie yeah. yeah yeah Finnegan would be proud of that yeah I think yes. he would in so what's the what's the standard there I know in trademarks there's like immoral or scandalous marks can't be registered until recently there was some new decisions but what's the test in patent for whether something is patentable or not because it's too inappropriate you know that's a good question it's pretty subjective um, you know, it's, if it's inappropriate, it's, it's not allowed, but there's, you know, there's tons of sex toys, things like that, of that nature. Um, so, you know, we had a rash of argue around it. bong patents, I think, right? Oh yeah. Oh, they don't even bother with those. I mean, it's gotta be pretty explicit to okay. be rejected. Um, I actually have never ran into any rejections like that myself. Um, but that's one that, you know, how many patents have overcome. you filed while you've been at Dunlap Bennett and Ludwig? Roughly. Um, I've filed thousands of patent applications since I've been here and I've uh, worked here for almost eight years now. So I've, I've seen them all. I yeah. Say. So, uh, so talk about the, 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 have you seen an uptick since a lot of states have legalized cannabis and marijuana and various, at various levels? Have you seen a big uptick in those patent filings? A lot of the Western states have, uh, legalized it, uh, at least, you know, you can say pot. Years. They've legalized Yeah, pot. legalized marijuana. It. Yeah. Reefer madness. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we don't handle those, those West Coast cases. But, you know, I would say ever since I've worked here, there's been a steady stream of, of different types of paraphernalia. We do handle patents for people on the West Coast. Yes. Because uh, the U.S. United States Patent and Trademark Office is here, oddly, in the East Coast 
for everybody in the United States. Yes. That's right. right? That's yeah, absolutely um, right. So, so you can actually, speaking of that, you can actually patent uh, strains of plants, right? And, and kind of, so it, it would be possible for a grower to kind of have a unique strain of pot that they could yeah. apply for a patent? Or? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, plant patents, if you have a new and unique strain, uh, it's got to be unisex. Um, and uh, yeah, so you could potentially get a, a patent on that. So you could patent an apple that gets you high. <laughs> yes. I'm just thinking, just like I'm ideating. I think it's not a bad idea. Start yeah. cross pollinating and yeah. get that. I think works. it's a good idea. No, that's good. You could, uh, let's come up with a list of fruits that maybe we can yeah. do that. But we're we're not here to talk about how to actually do the invention. So another question. Let's talk about what you need for a patent. So I had somebody call me once, and they said, um, and this was just kind of a consultation I did 15 years ago, and the guy said, I've got, and I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble because I'll tell you what he said. I've got an idea for a patent and I want your help. And I said, okay, tell me what the idea is. He said, you're not going to steal it. I said, no, we're lawyers. We can't steal your invention. That's something else people need to know. When you talk to a lawyer, they've got an obligation to keep whatever you say secret, no matter what. Um, so he told me his idea and he said, my idea is, he said, did you ever see that movie Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox? You guys see that? Movie? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he yeah. said, you remember that hoverboard that Michael J. Fox had? I kind of vaguely remembered it, but it was like a, a, a skateboard, but with no wheels and it hovered and he would skate on it. And he said, that's my invention. And I said, well, that's actually pretty cool. Um, so we'll get started. We'll send you a disclosure form. He said, well, I don't know how to make it. Um, you're the patent attorney. I need you to make it uh, for me and tell me how to do it, but don't steal that invention. Right. And I said, well, you're just, you saw something in a movie and that's your invention, but you have no idea how to do it. Is that correct? He said, yeah. yeah. So, so. I mean, I, I told him I couldn't help him. Yeah. And I couldn't pass him on to the prosecution team. Was I wrong? Uh, no, that's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, when it comes to patent applications, you have to disclose uh, enough of the invention so that one skilled in the art can read the patent application and then actually create it themselves. So that's how you kind of separate the... So it the, couldn't be like, watch the movie. In your patent yeah. application. If you watch the movie, you will know how to make it. Yeah, those. exactly. It, it, watching the movie itself isn't going to show you exactly how it's done. You nobody like really knows how that's narrow, done. Right? Okay, magnets, polarity, yeah. power. Yeah. You need to have like the whole thing figured That's out. absolutely right. You got to so, describe it. Now, another misconception, though, that I run into is you don't have to make it. You don't have to have actually made it, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, that's correct. You can just say, here's my idea, and here's how you would make it, like a nuclear reactor. Yeah. Right? So here's how you would make this. But so the cancer guy with the lemon zest and paprika, he told you how to make it. So, so what's, what's the issue there? He sure. said, Here, here's how you do it. You grind up some lemons and put in some paprika and cancer cured, done. Yeah, Why that's a great question. File? That's yeah. a great question. I mean, of course you can file anything, right? But you can when sue it comes anyone, to the, you can file anything. Yes, yeah. you can file anything. It's America. Uh, but the examiner, he's going to want the data to, to show that it's enabling. So for the invention to be patentable. Mean? Yeah, so for the invention to, to be patentable, it has to have utility. Right? So it has to have some sort of function, it has to work. Um, and when you submit applications that have to do with you know, curing certain diseases, you gotta prove it with the data. And, and that's why I asked him for the data and unfortunately the psychic answer that he gave me just didn't cut it. We, we have to have hard data from labs and, and what would essentially happen is you don't have to submit the data with the application, but when the application is rejected, that's when you have to submit the data to the examiner. Uh. So I was saving him some money by saying, I don't think so. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, patent prosecution, if you're talking to a corporate attorney, corporate counsel, strategically, what advice do you give somebody at a corporation about how they manage when their employees invent stuff? Yeah. What, what is it that, that a corporate attorney should do for their company to make sure those inventions aren't, you know, you, you invent a new way to run a patent law practice and you're like, oh, I'm going to take that and I invented this and, and run from the company. How does it, and that's not a great example, but say I'm at a, a solar panel company. I come up with a new way to put solar panels on a house while I work there. Yeah. Is that the company's invention? Is it Good my question. invention? Good question. Um, if I'm a, a corporate counsel, how do I get ahead of that problem? Sure. So um, you have every employee sign an employment agreement that assigns, essentially assigns the rights of the patent um, to the company. So when you're working there, when you're using their equipment, uh, you have to assign those rights to the company. And almost any big company will have 
uh, those types of clauses, especially for engineers, yeah, uh, I bet. you know, within their employment contract. So if I'm already at a big company, I've probably signed that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I probably can't. Now, could I invent like a garage paint sprayer if I'm at a solar panel company? Is that probably mine? Yeah. Does so it matter? That's perfectly fine. You can do that. And actually, I have a, a pretty interesting story about that. Okay. Sometimes, you know, I'll run into uh, clients, and in, in particular, this one client, um, where they had a machinist to create their invention. And the problem was is that they hired him to make the invention, but he actually added a little bit to the invention. He, he included a, a, a feature that made the invention work better. Uh, they didn't have any contracts before uh, they hired him to make the product. And, and that, that's where you run into a sticky so that, situation. So that machinist became an inventor. That's right. He was added on to the, the patent. patent. Oh, boy. They were fighting back about it and everything. But luckily, you know, they were working with a really nice guy, uh, and he decided to sign the assignment agreement. But he didn't have to do that. Uh, he could have been a partial owner to that invention. So that is a huge thing to get ahead of. If you work with anybody on your invention, yeah. they need to assign all the rights to you or to your company or yeah, and whatever then, it is. Right? These are the small inventors that aren't the corporations. Right. If they're hiring somebody to create their invention, prototype companies, I mean, it happens all the time, right? You, you need to make the invention and then sell it. So it's extremely important to get on top of that beforehand have your contracts all lined up, making sure that they assign those patent rights to you. For sure. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, so is there anything else from a patent perspective? Like, why do I need a patent? That's the name of our show today. And not me, but if I'm an inventor, why would anyone need a patent? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, you know, the biggest issues I come across are inventors that make a product, they start selling it, it starts selling, you know, like crazy. They're making a ton of money on it and then they want to protect it. And they'll come to me and they'll ask, you know, hey, can we file a patent application? Well, it's been on sale. Okay, well, how long? So there's a 12 month period that you're allowed to sell a product. It's called the on sale bar. The on sale bar, right? it's, it's selling it, publishing it, or even offering to sell it. So if you offer to sell it at Walmart, even if nobody buys it, that counts as the, uh, Start the on sale bar. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of clients that will sell their product and call me up and say, hey, this is doing great. Let's patent it. And I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry, it's so outside the 12 months. Yeah, so getting to the root of the problem, though, the problem is it's selling like hotcakes, whatever that means, and now somebody can copy it, right? right? Exactly. And you can't out compete them in the market. So, you, so the benefit of the patent, why you need a patent, is to get ahead of that. That's right. Now, let me ask you about the 12-month bar. I've heard, I believe this is the case, that even if you're within that 12 months, and you get your patent filed in that 12 month period, say I wanna do the same thing in England or Japan or another country, do I lose my rights in those other countries? It depends on the country. Okay. So each country has their own uh, but I might. laws, but you could, okay. absolutely. I yep. mean, I, I've heard that the US is pretty unique in that regard and sort of the default elsewhere is you've got a patent before you start selling or sharing the idea. Yeah, Right. Yep, that's, that's the, absolutely right. That's the preferred thing. So talk to me about, I hear provisional patent. Is there such a thing? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, can, do I own a provisional patent? Can I? Infer? I see. I see what you're saying. So, I mean, technically, it's not a uh, a patent. It's never going to grant. Um, but a provisional patent is important for those inventors who don't want to spend a whole lot of money on it, but want to test the product. So, if somebody comes to me and they, they say, you know, I don't really know if this is going to be a good product. I don't know if uh, it's going to sell well. I really don't want to invest a whole lot into it. Uh, that's what I'll recommend is a provisional patent. It gets their filing date with the patent office and it gives them 12 months to try and sell it in the market and see how well it does. And as long as they, uh, they file a non-provisional utility, which is the actual patent application, within the 12 months, what happens is the, the non-provisional utility will backdate to the provisional application. So it relates back to that. So you're yes. essentially, your utility application, even though you file it six months after you file your provisional, the date of that utility is the date that you filed your provisional. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, the provisional is a good way of preventing yourself from, from missing that 12-month bar, yeah. right? So you file a provisional, then you start selling it, and you'll have a filing date that's before whenever you started selling it. How long does it take for me to get a patent application, a patent, non-provisional utility patent granted to get like a, that's this a is your question. patent? Yeah, that's, and this usually disappoints clients the most um, it's two to four years from the filing, and it, it really depends on the type of patent. I mean, I've had mechanical, simple mechanical inventions get through within a year. Um, but, you know, software, 
uh, the longer applications, you know, the examiners don't want to examine. Right? So I mean, can you takes longer. Um, can you speed that up? Is there anything that yeah. you pay an extra fee to the U.S. P United States Patent and Trade? Yeah, the government always accepts fees to expedite processes. So you know, there's a track one. Well, not in trademark. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. No, nothing there. No, nope. Expedite. That's unfortunate. We, we all wish. Yeah. But so patents has an expedite process, right? Yeah. Well, trademarks don't take as long, right? I mean, what are we talking? They year take so? up to a year sometimes. Yeah. Year. yeah. Yeah, two to four years is a big difference. So, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, basically, you pay the fee, and you should be able to get the patent uh, if you know they end up granting it, allowing it within a year. Okay. So, so, and also um, something important to mention is uh, if you're 65 or older, uh, the patent office is willing to give you your results within a year because you know they figure time is limited. So. <laughs> That's depressing. Enough. Yes, it is, but it's a benefit. You know, it's a, a bittersweet type of. Uh, so, if you have just one of a couple inventors, as long as that one inventor is over yeah, sixty-five, right. you get a free expedited app. Essentially, a free track. Or not, not a free, but you get free expedited. Expedited. Yep, that's right. No fee. So right. if someone's knocking off my product during that two to four years, can I shut them down, or that's I have to wait question. the whole four years? So that's a very good question. Um, you, you have to file track one when you file the application. So. You know, so oh, you can't go back and say, hurry up now. So what you can do is there's options though. So let's say you just filed the application okay. and you know, you figure out somebody is infringing and you, you want to get it through as quickly as possible. What you can do is file what's called a continuation application and file the track one with the continuation. Oh, I see. So you yeah. have two applications going, but your second application thing. goes faster. That's right. The second application and goes faster go within the year and you can go after the infringer. So oh. sometimes clients will do that. But you can go back in time, once your patent's granted, go back and get the wrong that that person... Yes. Mm. The biggest problem with that, though, is that the claims have to be consistent. Uh, and that's, you know, a lot of... I mean, I would say 90% 90, 90 of applications I file, I'm amending the claims. Uh, so it's very difficult to get retroactive damages. Um, it's better to speed things along. With oh, I see. Okay. That makes sense. Is there anything else that... Um, a business owner should think about when it comes to patents? I mean, should they think about um, well, what do I have that's patentable or what do I have? What, what is my IP? I mean, what, what considerations when you talk to somebody who has a business or you talk to an attorney that is counsel for a business, what is it that you generally, what are the things you run into most? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, most people believe since the invention isn't on the market, uh, it's unique. And, and they'll mistakenly, you know, file the application without doing a patentability search. I always advise clients to do patentability searches because there's plenty of people who filed applications uh, and didn't bring them to market. I mean, it's so common because that's the hardest part, you know, is bringing something to market, be, being successful in the market. Uh, so there's plenty of patent applications that have been filed and then, you know, just aren't used. So it's always great to get a search. I mean, it's, it's necessary almost um, just to make sure it's patentable and you don't waste a lot of money on it. Okay. And thanks a lot for telling us about nasty pants and other things. Yeah, that was fun. You know, hopefully we'll get some more clients like that and, and have cured cancer. Stories. Yep. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play so you never miss an episode. And to catch us on video, check out our website at blackletterstudios.com. 